Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on using our stories to win. Um, this webinar uh, is being presented by the Native Organizers Alliance, which is a project of the Alliance for a Just Society um, and being sponsored by the uh, Communities Creating Healthy Environments Initiative. And today we have a number of distinguished presenters with us. Uh, uh, we have Rhonda Pitka, who is uh, with the Council of Athabascan Tribal Governments. Rhonda is the chief of her village in Beaver, Alaska, and chairwoman of the Council of Athabascan Tribal Governments. Uh, we also have Michael Lynn Hawk from Indian People's Action. Michael Lynn is the um, executive director of Indian People's Action based in uh, Montana. And we also have Jonathan Ray with iRoots Media. Um, he is from Laguna Pueblo, New Mexico. Um, and uh, he does a number of projects with iRoots uh, Media, including videography, edit, um, editing, and youth presentations, as well as a radio show, and works closely with the disability community um, by documenting the lack of sidewalks in historic cities. Um, and so today, the, the way we're going to run uh, this presentation is throughout we're gonna go through the presentation. Anytime you have any questions um, or issues come up with technology, you can feel free to uh, send me a message in the chat box on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, you can choose various people in there, and it looks like my name comes up several different times, perhaps because of the login. I'm the very first Denisha Christian <laughs> listed there, so if you want to send me a question at any point for any of the presenters, at the end we'll have a question and answer session where the presenters will be able to um, take your questions. All right. So we wanted to start with just talking about our roots and history and indigenous storytelling. This is not new for indigenous communities. Um, it's something that I would say mainstream uh, communities are starting to pick up on more and um, and and learn, you know, from the people who have had oral traditions and used um, oral history uh, in in. Uh, their communities for a long period of time. So, um, you know, in indigenous storytelling, oral traditions um, pass along our histories. Uh, they're also responsible for the preservation of our, our cultures. Um, and in many respects, storytelling alone is kind of a revolutionary act um, or act of resistance. Um, sorry, I'm gonna mute a couple of microphones here. Um, so, whoops, so, um, <clears throat> yes, so storytelling can also be considered, um, an act of resistance in and of, it, in of itself. Uh, also, storytellers, um, carry a lot of respect and, um, uh, the very act of sharing a personal story, you know, uh, uh, among many of our communities is um, is something that's not taken lightly. People, when people share their stories, they're listened to. People are quiet, they don't interrupt, you don't argue. Um, you know, those are some of the simple things that, you know, in our communities, you know, storytellers carry a, a lot of uh, respect and um, admiration. And so the power behind the stories are, are, um, are recognized, I think. Um, also, it's important just to point out that our stories aren't just passed on through like, um, you know, uh, a story or um, written in a book, so to speak. So, uh, you know, our stories are off also our prayers, our songs, our dances. These, these are also other ways in which we tell our stories. So in community organizing, stories are key. So, um, you know, the very idea that um, we have to show our numbers um, in order for community organizing to be impactful um, 
stories are helpful in a number of different ways. Um, for one, it's a way to highlight the experiences that um, we point to. So oftentimes, you know, people have these experiences in their lives and we don't want people or, you know, decision makers to think that those are isolated events. Um, that, you know, by collecting a number of different stories, we're able to highlight the fact that um, these problems are systemic and broad and don't, are not just because one individual may have made a bad choice or, or lived their life a certain way, that there's actually a structure and systems in place. Um, and so that's one reason why collecting stories is key to community organizing. It's also great when reporters call you to have stories on deck already. Um, oftentimes reporters are on really quick, tight time frames and deadlines and so if we have already collected stories of people that we can refer them to that have individual experiences on the issues that we're working on um, it saves a lot of time um, it also I think collecting stories ahead of time helps members be able to speak at events. So when we're putting on events and we want to highlight people with personal stories, we already have stories prepared. Um, and members will then be able to read their story or have story presented in a way that, you know, they don't have to start from scratch. They don't have to worry about oversharing or undersharing. You know, they have their story prepared for them. Um, and then also, you know, we have the people in our communities who are either too sick, too old, too, you know, uh, don't have enough money to travel. Um, and if we have these stories prepared ahead of time, um, other people can read and share their stories on their behalf. They're also great for writing op-eds and letters to the editor, so having stories prepared ahead of time with people. Um, with personal experiences can be used um, in other means as well. Um, and it's a great way, story collection is a great way to engage community members um, in campaigns. So oftentimes, you know, we have um, the quiet people, we have people who don't want to be up front, and, and sometimes people have a challenge trying to figure out how to engage them in um, various campaigns and fights and um, getting them involved in collecting stories from other community members um, is a good way to engage them and give them a role to play in the campaign. And having stories is useful for press, right? That kind of goes back to the second bullet point there. Uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, or not, not even we want to make sure, it's oftentimes these, these stories that we collect can turn into products. So if it's a video, if it's a storybook, and we'll have other examples of those things, what we could use those stories for. Um, once we have a product, that's something that we can share out and could potentially be a press hook for our issues. So the more attention that we can get in the media on our issue, the better. So, um, as mainstream folks are catching up on this storytelling thing, they've kind of dubbed it uh, um, participatory action research. Um, so collecting our own stories situates us to be our own experts on our issues. Um, we don't need um, outside academics to come in and study us to be, our, to be able to speak on our issues. We don't need to have degrees or a bunch of letters after our names in order to speak on our issues. The point of this is really, if we live our lives, then we are the experts on our lives. Um, and telling their, our personal stories has as much clout, if not more, um, than other forms of, of research as well. And it will always be accurate and persuasive. It's really hard to argue with people um, as they um, share their own personal stories. Um, so it also gives us an opportunity to frame the story at the way that we want to. We don't have to uh, accept dominant or mainstream um, um, media or our opposition's beginning point to the story. We can tell the story in the way that we want to tell the story. And it also credentials our experiences as well. I think once we have a tidy little product, whether it's a storybook or video or photo documentary project or whatever it is, once we have a finished product, 
Um, that product, I think, somehow credentials us. <laughs> um, it's uh, with a pretty little bow on it, we're able to take it around and have people listen to us and, and, um, and I think often, oftentimes take us more seriously um, as well. And it provides us an opportunity, this research does, to frame our demands as recommendations. So depending on where we are in our campaigns also, um, we may not wanna be hard hitting with our demands or we may wanna have um, a um, two layered approach where we have our demands and we're working our demands, but we also wanna have a policy approach and we can provide a set of recommendations at the end of these stories um, um, that also are in line with our, with our demands for the campaign. So, um, this slide is similar to the last slide. So it's a form of research, community or participatory action research is a form of research that makes community members the experts on our, on our subject matters. It could be storybooks, surveys, photo documentary projects, videos. Um, it could be in a number of different formats. Um, it allows for community members to get involved in the campaign, to create our own narrative, provides a human side of the story. So oftentimes we have a lot of data this, and providing stories to go along with it um, really humanizes it. And it explains the issue in a way that um, everyday people um, can be able to relate to it. So um, that is also um, very helpful. Uh, it can also um, increase the relationships that we have in the community as well. So if there are decision makers or opinion leaders or other allies that we want to bring into the campaign, these are projects that can often um, give them a way in. Uh, so we have a couple of examples that we want to share and then we'll go back and talk about um, how it was done. So um, Rhonda, I want to hand it over to you now to talk a little bit about the campaign that CATG has been working on for a long time in Alaska, but, um, <clears throat> but share a little bit about the campaign and then also talk about the story and, and share a story with us as well. Are you there, Rhonda? Yeah, I am here, thanks. Um, I was just going to talk briefly about about our story. Um, our story was was an was an important part of our campaign to um, to get some fish and wildlife rights back. Um, you know, last year, Denisha. Well, it was two years ago now, Denisha and Denisha and Carrie Stevens um, came through and collected stories all over the Yukon Flats. So part of that was one of my grandmother's stories. Uh, my grandmother was a subsistence fisher, fisherwoman uh, her whole life. So this is her story. I'm 82 years old. When I was a little kid, we moved the fish camp at a certain time of summer, moved the muskrat camp at a certain time of spring, and wintertime we moved the camp. When the moose were having their babies, we never bothered them. We just hunted moose in the fall, and we only went after bulls. Once in a while, we got grouse or rabbits, so we always had something to eat. We'd get our fish and moose so it would last all year round, all nine months of cold winter. Nowadays, we have to pull up our salmon fishing net, and instead of trying to catch little fish in the side school, they tell us, you're supposed to pull the net out. No, put it back in. Pull it out. It's pretty hard for me and my little grandsons. We get white fish and pike, and that's what we live on. We don't get very many salmon anymore, maybe four or five a day. But we really take care of it so it lasts us all winter. Enforcement really started getting bad just a couple of years ago. They come and harass us for people who live on the river. The state enforcement tried to take my net without me knowing it. If they were human beings, they would come by and talk with me. I'm just an 82-year-old lady trying to get enough fish for the winter. If we can't fish, I don't know what we can live on. Half of our diet is fish. We have no jobs and no income to buy food. 
We have to go out into the, into the woods and get our own. I'm glad I'm 82 years old. So I won't be living too much longer. So I don't have to see this kind of baloney going on. But I feel sorry for my grandchildren. What do they care about our grandchildren? What do they care about what we eat? They're taking away our life. I just feel like they should line us up on the bank and shoot us off so they can have the whole land. Um, that was a story that they collected two years ago from my grandmother Elsie. She's 84 years old this year and she um, this might be the first summer in 84 years that she's missed going to fish camp. The salmon run was disastrous this year, so they haven't they hadn't allowed us even subsistence fishing. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Can you share a little bit about um, how the storybook was used in the campaign? Yeah, we um, we had a press briefing. The, the Alliance for a Just Society helped us set up a press briefing with um, Senator Begich, and we invited our other, our other senators and our representative, Don Young, too, but nobody came. It was during a time in D.C. when they had um, snow, snowpocalypse, so that, that was their excuse for not coming. Hello? Yes, and would you, say, would you say that it gave, um, that you got much traction out of this storybook, that you were able to advance your campaign? Yeah, yeah, we really did. We got a lot of, um, we actually got a lot of use out of it. Um, we combined it with what Otna was doing to, to you know, they're, they're trying for the same thing, basically. They want a co-management project because they have even worse even worse hunting um, with their moose because everybody in the state goes to their land to hunt. Um, I mean, with us, it's, it's a, just a matter of numbers in the Canadian escapement for fishing. So what happened was um, Mark Begich uh, read the report and his staff members are a lot of our supporters. So they, um, so he was able to, to use it and, and really, really start talking about subsistence in a way that hadn't been talked about before. So it was kind of amazing what this, what this work did. Um, you know, my grandma's report, I feel like she really edited herself there a few times. <laughs> and she, you know, she's really, she's really, really upset this year because we got very few king salmon, but along the Yukon river this year, we all, um, signed a moratorium agreement. So we all agreed to not fish kings. So right now everybody is fishing silvers. It's it's a different fish and but it's it's still a salmon. So at least we'll have something in our in our freezers this winter. Thank you, Denisha. Thank you, Rhonda. Appreciate you sharing and sharing your grandma's story. I appreciate it. We're going to have another example now from Michael N. Hawk, um, an Indian People's Action, to talk about the American Debt Unpaid storybook. Michael N., are you there? Oops. Let me unmute you. I'm assuming this is you. Are you there, Michael N.? Oh, darn. She was just here. There, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. Um, my name is Michael Lynn Hawk, and I'm with, um, I'm the director of Indian People's Action in the state of Montana. Back in 2009, with this, an American Debt Unpaid, um, how we actually started out was we began with um, listening sessions. Um, getting into the area of the reservation is a very touchy situation when you're an urban Indian organization. And this was a pilot project we actually did that actually turned out to be successful. Um, because as you all know, working within reservation boundaries, you always have opponents and proponents within the reservation boundaries on a certain issue. But as far as the um, IHS, we all know everybody has issues with 
the Indian Health Service when it comes to healthcare. So what we did was we initially started out having uh, listening sessions. And through all this, uh, believe it or not, we actually came out with two storybooks. But this was one of the more prevalent ones because the IKEA was coming out at the national level in Washington, D.C. So what we did was during these lis listening sessions, we were able to actually, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, there was a lot of echoing now that stopped. Are you there, Denisha? I think oh, she yeah. turned herself, I yeah, think she I turned herself down. I right turned there. my mute off. I think yeah. I was the culprit. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Now turn yourself off, Denisha. You're echoing. Jokes. <laughs> 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 um, but the, um, the American Debt Unpaid, we gathered stories here in Montana. Um, and this was a very strong working tool for us as an organization before the Indian Health Care Improvement Act was being initiated at the national level in Washington, D.C. So once we gathered these stories, the alliance at the time was still Northwestern Federation for Community Organization and now their Alliance for Just Society. We sent all our stories up there. They did the, the editing, getting everybody's story together and making sure it was right, um, getting the edited versions back to the people and saying, is this the way it sounds? Which I really like because, you know, the thing about it is you don't want to get their stories and, you know, they themselves had not edited the right way. Um, all in all, the book was put together during um, the IKEA when it was coming into session and they were bringing the bill forward and the discussion was do, um, do we want to put this right along with the bigger health care and some said we don't think it should be, we did it last time, blah blah blah, um, and it didn't work, it didn't pass. So this, I, 2010, they actually took this as a separate bill, the IKEA, and it passed. But before that, we as organizations, not just Indian People's Action here in the state of Montana, there was other native organizations throughout the United States that have stories in this book, and we utilized this as a working tool at the national level. And us in Montana went and approached Senator Bacchus and Senator Tester and actually, you know, gave them a copy of these story books and told them the health care disparities in the state of Montana. So this was, it was a huge win and as Indian People's Action, we played a part at the national level by submitting this book and letting our congressmen know in Washington, D.C how bad was within the healthcare system of the IHS and why that was was because of the funding. So um, after that we still continued to stay on the health care and I'm going to read if I've got time to read Claudette Fox's story Back in 1987, I had gallbla gallbladder surgery and a tubal litigation. I had no reason to think anything but had gone wrong with that operation. More than 20 years later, though, I found out what had really happened. I went to see a doctor at the Indian Health Service in January of 2008. I would noticed that my arms were getting thinner and my belly was growing larger. That seemed very strange to me. I explained my concerns to the doctor. He said, it's something that just comes with age and told me it was all in my head. I left with Zantac, an antacid. When my ring slipped,
when now I lost I lost myself when my ring slipped right off my finger in May I knew I wasn't just it wasn't just in my head mm -hmm. I went to the doctor again but I didn't go to the IHS I went to the billing clinic instead the doctor I saw there took me seriously enough to send me to a gynecologist he said Claudette I don't want to scare you but just looking at you I have a feeling you have a tumor the next day I had fluid taken from my right side but I had to have more fluid taken because the first time they didn't get enough to test six days later I had fluid taken from my left side that came back positive it turned out I had fibroids in my uterus I went in for a hysterectomy at the end of June they also removed seven liters of fluid and found a tumor which had grown from the stub of my appendix and spread to my left ovary I say stub because I didn't have a full appendix which I was very surprised to learn it turned out that back in the 1980s when the surgeon was removing my gallbladder he took part of my appendix too at first IHS didn't want to pay for the procedures because I hadn't asked for authorization to see the doctor at the Billings Clinic I filled I filled out an appeal through because I don't have insurance and because I knew I had made the right choice I didn't accept that my symptoms were all in my head and I didn't accept that my concerns shouldn't be taken seriously I wished I could say this was just a fluke but something similar happened to my daughter she felt very sick went to the Crow IHS and was treated for the flu later she went to the Harden clinic and found out she had kidney failure she'd been on dialysis ever since I'm sharing my story because no one should have to go through what would have gone through should have to go through what we've gone through we should feel that our doctors are listening to us treating us as human beings and giving us care that we can trust and just for your guys' information, her daughter died just about three years ago because of the mistake the Crow Northern Cheyenne Hospital made. Because I, I stay in touch with her. And her daughter died because of um, the kidney failure that was failed. All right, I'm done. Um, thank you, Michael Ann. Thank you for sharing those stories, both of you. Um, as you can see, the stories are that we that were collected were very strong stories, um, and you know everyone has a story like this. It may not be related to healthcare. It might be related to um, uh, hunting and fishing. It might be related to something else. Um, everyone has a story. Um, and so um, really seeking out people's stories and being able to capture their voice, which I think was also really well done in both of these examples. You could hear the voice of the people um, speaking um, in both of them. They're both very powerful. So thank you um, for sharing those. Um, and I want to run through some steps for gathering stories. I know Michael Lynn's case, um, she gathered the stories in Montana by doing listening sessions um, to begin with. Um, and it's important in the, to know your starting point. So to understand your issue and the framework and your talking points uh, before you go out and, and seek these stories so that you are able to capture um, the most compelling story. Um, you want to identify the kinds of stories that will illustrate the problem and the solution that you're promoting. 
Um, you want to develop a questionnaire that will gather the information that you need to write the story. Um, and I have an example of, of one of those questionnaires that I'll share with you all um, shortly. And then uh, you'll want to conduct the interview, um, get a photograph and a consent, and um, make sure that those are signed off on. Oftentimes people want to remain anonymous, and that's totally fine. Um, you can assign fake names as long as you get the consent to use the story story. Um, and then once you prepare the story, you want to be sure to share it back with the person to make sure that it's accurate. Um, and then it's important to consider the type, the, the variety of stories that were collected as well. Uh, you don't want them all from one specific constituency group, unless that's the type of report that you're producing. Um, but a variety in order to show the breadth of the issue is often what we're looking for. So, you know, professors, authors, nonprofit leaders, you want to make sure you have a variety of youth and elders and a variety of uh, families families and clans represented as well. And then I, the, here's an example, and it's pretty small here, but the type of a story collection form, this is the beginning of one. I think this is the one that was used um, in Rhonda's report to collect stories from people who were doing the, um, the campaign to decriminalize traditional hunting and fishing practices. So. It, it asks open-ended questions. The point of this is not to get yes or no answers or really short one or two sentence answers. We want to be able to capture um, people's voice and so we want to be able to have people complete these or complete them yourselves as much as possible. Um, all open-ended questions uh, that will hopefully be able to, um, you'll be able to take the answers from this question and turn it into a story. So both of those, well, actually, um, in the second story, the story of Claudette, um, her story was collected by one of these forms. So it wasn't written out in that format. It was collected in one of these, these forms. We turned it into a story that was written in that format and then sent it back to her to make sure it was accurate, that those were her words and her experiences. Um, so uh, this form is used as a tool and then an example of the consent um, showing that the person is agreeable. You can see here that there's a spot that if people want to remain anonymous or have a, a false name, fake name assigned to them, that they're willing to do that as well. But we have to have one of these on file for each story. So the storybook was one example, but there are many other examples of how um, story collection can um, can be documented so and, and used as well. So um, surveys can be used, um, photo exhibits, video blogs, video mock trials. There are a variety of different things. And we're going to have um, John talk about uh, digital story gathering here now. So Jonathan, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you all for having me. And thank you all for sharing those uh, amazing stories. I'm very happy to be here. So first, uh, I'll talk off. Um, I'm Jonathan Ray from iRoots Media here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we'd like to start off with the top 10 digital storytelling best practices. Number one. The well-being. Storytellers' well-being should be at the center of all phases. Now, this includes knowing that you're talking to a human being, so they need to be respected. Uh, a lot of times, documentary people, uh, researchers say subject. And in our culture, in our ways, they're people. And so it's understanding their, their connection to the story and having that respect. Strategies to ensure the well-being of vulnerable participants are particularly important. Number two. It's fine. <laughs> Create a storyboard. The storyboard will aid in the editing process. It is important to draft an outline of your story. Interview questions should translate smoothly with each other. Now with a storyboard, it's very important to, to have one because it helps outline your ideas, uh, the, the direction you want to go. Uh, and it also helps explain the story, especially if you want to have funders or backers come to you. It's kind of nice to have a storyboard of your direction. Number three. Language. Interviews should be conducted in local languages when possible. 
Now, this is, this is critical working in small communities. A lot of times through translation, many of their information is lost. And when possible, you try to find a cultural insider. Now, a cultural insider is anyone from a, uh, a local hero to uh, a tribal leader, um, someone who uh, maybe uh, works a lot in the community. Uh, someone like that who may help you find someone who can uh, help translate uh, the languages. Number four, local relevance. The digital storytelling process should be appropriate and sensitive to local context. Working with different pueblos in New Mexico, we've learned that there's a lot of cultural sensitivity around uh, even just looking at a mountain. Uh, a mountain could be something sacred to someone or to that community and can be filmed. So there needs to be uh, an understanding to that, that not all shots can be shot. Uh, and that's very important working with uh, indigenous communities. Right now, I want to show you all a video clip from a student who works for the No To Be Gay Foundation 3. Um, she is one of the interns there. She did a video on one of their warrior workshops where they try to uh, promote well, well-being and health. And she used... Um, a very interesting way of telling that story. So I would ask if you could play a minute and a half, two minutes, it'd be fine. Thanks. Alright, number five, instruct within community. Now that means instruction within a community provides you or the youth with access to resources. Uh, resources include elder centers, uh, diabetes prevention centers, local government, uh, tribal officials, uh, local officials. Uh, it's just kind of a way to let let you explore the resources you already have. As indigenous peoples, a lot of times our resources are not in the internet or in libraries. They're actually your neighbor, your cousin, your grandma. So it's basically trying to find resources within that community and have them be included within the project. Number six, recording and technology. Understanding community's view on recording and technology will aid in appropriate film filming. Facilitators should work with partners and, where possi and, when possible, engage local teaching assistants. Methods should be adapted to fit technological resources and capacities. Now, this is kind of where it ties into where you want to be very sensitive to people talking. A lot of times you go into an area, this is their first time talking in front of a camera, so you need to be aware of that, knowing how to shoot to where you're not in their space. And also, another thing that includes this is knowing your technology and your recording system. So when you're entering someone's home or entering someone's community, it's kind of good to know your, your equipment, knowing where the sound is, knowing how to work the camera, the lights. That way, when you get to this environment of their area, you're not wasting their time and you can get those moments that you want to get uh, on video or in recording. Number seven, provide direction. Providing direction allows for more creativity. So before you start 
before the start of any project, decide on a theme. Uh, this is when you have brainstorming activities where you can have your team together to shoot out ideas. But at the end, there needs to be a theme. And with this team, it just with this theme, it allows you to create in a direction. Number eight, build trust. It is important to build trust within the community you are filming in. This was a big one for me. Uh, my my great mentor, uh, late George Stoney, he's he's known as the godfather of public television, and he basically told us as students that to never forget the people that you meet. It is more important than any reward or any film that you make because when you go into someone's community, they will remember you. And as a filmmaker, you might go into 100 communities and be filming all the time. But for that one person that you talk to and connect it to, they will remember you. And that is something to never forget, that these are people, people that live these stories, and that needs to be treated with respect. So building trust is a big one for me, especially as a filmmaker. Number nine, challenging youth or your team. It is important to challenge your challenge youth or your team during the creative process. Now, one of the examples we have for challenging your team or the people you're working with is to create an environment of trying to tell a story without using your voice. Uh, we like to do silent film projects to where we have our students create an emotion or a story without any words, and that kind of helps get you out of the box sometimes when being creative. So it's always good to try to have challenges, um, risks as well to take with those challenges, uh, positive risks, ways to approach the camera and ways to tell the story. Number 10, a dedicated YouTube or Vimeo channel. Now this is also figures out about your target audience, all right? So if you're doing a uh, your target audience in a really located area, uh, re really small area where there's no internet access, probably not making a YouTube or Vimeo might help. More than likely making DVDs to put into uh, local libraries, doing uh, public screenings at uh, casinos or whatever uh, businesses are in the area. Uh, but if you're more in the areas where there is internet and the, the knowledge you want to send out is to the worldwide, uh, YouTube is a great place. Vimeo is another place to where it's more of a professional setting where if you're trying to find backers for funding, uh, sending to the UN, uh, things like that, more than likely the Vimeo project would be more in that lane. But the idea is to, when you make something, get it out there. Uh, we heard earlier in the, conf in the conference calls that the more that's out there, the more it's aware, the more we can use as resources, as a working tool, as a tool to use to get uh, what is needed for our communities. Um, and that's my last slide. Thank you so much um, for having us here. Uh, this is John Ray from iRoots Media from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was great. So just to, to recap, um, so a storybook is just one vehicle. Um, uh, storybook report is just one vehicle of using, um, uh, of getting our stories told and out there and document the community's experience. Um, and these kind of tools um, are, are helpful in our campaigns because they uh, substantiate ourselves and credential ourselves as, as um, as experts on our, our own issues. They're also good to be uh, for the use of holding decision makers accountable, and that is key in community organizing. And so uh, these tools are also good resources to, for that. Um, finding good stories is key, and there are a number of different ways in which um, these stories can be captured and designed um, and shared out. Uh, in order to to tell the stories of our communities. So with that, we're going to take some questions. If there are any questions from the audience, you can chat them um, to either myself or Jonathan, um, because there are very a number of different Dinesh's in the queue there. Um, if you don't see, if, if I'm not seeing your question, you can go ahead and chat them to Jonathan or Michael Lynn as well, um, and we can answer your questions. I'll give you a moment there. And 
I guess I'll have a question that I'll, I'll kick out to either Michael Lynn or Rhonda. Um, and I'm just wondering about the hesitancy that you might get from community members. Did you get people who were nervous about sharing their personal stories? And um, how did you deal with that? Michael Lynn, I'll unmute you because I see you there if you're still around. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the hesitancy I think we've seen a lot was people would share their stories, but then we did get some where they gave us their stories, but they didn't want to share or they wanted to stay anonymous. So we actually uh, respected that. And then the ones that did share their stories, you know, were pretty open because they wanted everybody to know what actually happened to them. And like I said, with the one with um, Claudette Blackhawk, she wasn't scared to share because of the fact of, she figured she shared her story that everybody could see that, you know, what the disparities were with the IHS. And she was okay with it and there again, you know, um, I seen Jonathan on where, you know, yeah, we we got to respect the stories we gather from individuals and respect their wishes and basically editing some of the stories because we all know um, that, you know, some individuals aren't that great when they're writing out a sentence and that's some of the stuff we also ran into was we would have to help them write out sentences because our older people are, you know, they know they're not perfected in, you know, constructing a sentence. So, you know, we'd ask them word for word, you know, is this what you're trying to say? And they'd say yes. So, you know, we had to get it down just right. So it took a while, you know, um, getting the right wording down the way they wanted it because of the fact, you know, We've got to respect what they want in their stories. This is their story, you know, that they're sharing. So, you know, that's what we ran into is the structure of sentencing and actually getting, you know, sitting down and helping them write it is what, uh, you know, some of us had to do. So that's what we ran into. Excellent. Thank you for that. So thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any further um, questions or feedback that you want to provide us, uh, we can be reached at any of the websites listed. Um, and uh, you can also reach me at Danisha, D-A-N-I-S-H-A, at Alliance for a Just Society.org. Thank you so much. Thank you all.